Hi everyone. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day -day basis. My name's Greg Lawton, and I'm the CEO of an AI schedule management company called Nels and Links. And I'm Micah Pipo, a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. Hi, and I'm Ian Heptinstall. I'm Associate Professor in Project Management at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, but I'm a late career academic, so most of my career has been spent practitioner on projects. Wonderful. Ian, a pleasure to have you here. For everyone listening, each podcast is designed to give you strategies and tactics that you can implement right away. Today, Ian is in the hot seat. So, Ian, you are the longtime friend and mentor of the CEO of a major general contractor, and she's asked you to come in to assess the quality of the project management function. What do you do? As a start, what, uh, what's she meaning by quality? Uh, is she looking short or long term? Is it fit for the current purpose or does she have some longer term objective that she wants a comparison against? Beautiful. She's thinking long term. What her gut is, is that a number of clients are mentioning to her that they're not quite thrilled with the project management approach of the company. And because of that, they might be looking elsewhere when new contracts come up for offer. So she's thinking, how do I secure revenue growth into the future? Okay. Uh, some thoughts, and I might sort of, uh, go in a slightly different direction, because if I was talking directly to her, I'd probably have 20 minutes worth of questions to ask her, and it would depend upon what was answered. Uh, <clears throat> But if I can move into half speculation mode and mm -hmm. suggest some things that uh, they might be interested in. Uh, one of the things that I see as a sort of a potentially unassessed niche for a main contractor is thinking as a project owner. Uh, and, and by that, I mean managing the project towards the owner's overall objectives which is a common belief amongst people in the project community that that's what they do. But sometimes I feel that our commercial interests and common commercial practices get in the way of that. So I would start to explore whether this was a, a, an area open for examination. Are, are they willing to relook at how they currently make money? As a typical main Ooh. contractor, Maybe mm -hmm. they simply uh, take some nominal risk, add 15 or 20% sales tax to the work done by other people, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and maybe not add an awful lot of value in between. I might be more deferential in terms of maintaining my long-term friendship with the CEO, but... Uh, well, that, you mentioned that, two that things there, I thought. Back. I mean, you mentioned two things there that I thought were very, very interesting. I just want to, I want to double click and and understand them a little more. So you mentioned thinking as the owner, which to me, for example, could be setting up a red hat or a black hat team and having that yeah. internally to, uh, to give direction as to what the owner might be thinking at certain instances. But then the second is you said changing the business model of the business to be more aligned. Yeah. Um, those two, to me, are separate things. Do, do you see them as part of a similar theme of work, or is it more uh, dependent on the appetite of the conversation, which one you'd go down? Uh, probably a bit of the latter, but I see them intimately linked because the, mm -hmm. the common business model approaches of the main contracting industry has an impact upon what project owners can buy in the marketplace. And, mm -hmm. and if they only go out to the market when they have a project that they've got internal approval for and they've made a business case and they want to get going with it, they can only really buy from the kinds of main contractors who are there at the moment with their current capabilities. So if an owner is thinking, I would like to buy a different kind of service from a main contractor, that's probably something they need to develop and work at and think about and discuss in a longer time scale than shopping when individual project needs crop up. It's more strategic supply-based management than it is uh, spot purchasing. And I find a lot yeah. of our industry is driven by spot purchasing as opposed to shaping of the supply market. I, I, I love what you've just said because that is 
that is big brain strategic thinking. Now, I'm sure we could have a very long conversation about why the market is that way. For example, low profit rates, uh, not having overheads on books, the, the fact that they're looking to maximize uh, return on capital employed, not not purely return on profit, et cetera, um, and the different contracting models. But this is beyond deadlines, so I'll, I'll put you on the spot. If the three of us had a gun to our head and someone said, come up with what you think is the most, I, most owner-friendly model, which also makes profit for the contractor, what would you say? That would basic around the ideas and my experience of what we Brits call a project alliance, but is more often called IPD contracting in the mm-hmm. US. Uh, that, I think, has a couple of elements to it. I would find a way of engaging the construction supply base in the very early stages of the project before we know exactly what it is we need to build, mm-hmm. where the owner has an opportunity or a problem or a challenge to overcome. And part of the business case is saying, is there something we can do that's worth doing? So during that early stage of the project, one of the common outcomes is we can't find anything with a good enough return. Now, that is still a good early stage project investigation. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't found something. It doesn't mean the work was bad. It means there was nothing there. Now, very often the, the commercial mechanisms involved in using the construction supply base, bring them in fairly late on, and we've developed a totally separate supply base who, in theory, their job is to engineer and put the conception and the execution strategies together. But more and more over time, I've shift, seen that shift to their job is to put together a tender package that's let out to a supply market that mm-hmm. then wants the supply market, the construction experts are selected, then they redo the execution strategy and the design because they've got more up-to-date and appropriate knowledge. And all this adds extra delay and uh, cost. And even if it's in the client's interests, the client's pulling their hair out because it looks like delay, it looks like rework, it looks like unnecessary work. So I would look to involve the right people early on, which needs very different commercial and reward mechanisms at that early stage. So just be before, selecting you, just based, before you continue yeah. there, the, the commercial and reward mechanisms, um, I, I, think, I think you're spot on about. Um, what, what I've seen is when tenders are let at a late stage of uh, business case development, I've seen contractors who bid knowing that they're going to make their money from litigation and claims mm-hmm. or change. So they will yeah. bid in very predatory ways because if it's an open competition, the person with the lowest cost who solves the problem wins, and then but you're then locked into a one-to-one situation where the only way out is litigation or surety or something like mm-hmm. something like this. When you're talking about different kinds of incentives, can you give me an example of what that might look like on the on the early stage? Why would a general contractor engage so early on and essentially pay people's wages to engage without knowing that they're going to win some revenue? And I want to, I want to add a, one more on yeah, it just please. to make it even more challenging because this is something yeah. that I spin around on. When you bring them in that early, you then become attached to them and it becomes increasingly hard to switch because now they know yep. your design, your processes, and you're always looking over that hill that the grass is greener, wondering, well, now I have to switch and they have to train them on my processes and bring them in and get them up to speed. So with that incentives, how do you maintain a healthy relationship to be able to then potentially switch suppliers down the road? Or do you have to just make that perfect choice up front? I think you need to make a good enough choice up front. I think striving for perfection is uh, can take us down a wrong track in our industry because it's unknowable and un- unprovable. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, well, projects are social constructs. The, the concept of an optimum is, is probably misleading. 
There, there's many things that are good enough. And I think the benefits of getting a competent, good enough team together early to work collectively on the problem significantly outweigh the perceived disadvantage that you mentioned. But it's a relevant one, Micah, because if you don't adapt the the underlying uh, commercial processes, you can get trapped. And it is like uh, signing a blank check. We'll have to think up a new term for these days where uh, younger listeners will have to Google what a check is and uh, and watch some old videos to see. But uh, uh, hopefully the analogy still works. So. Um, the analogy I often make is the one with recruitment. When we're recruiting people, we, we look to recruit on competence capability. We do not do arm's length assessment of CVs, you know, technical bid. I'll look mm-hmm. at your CV. I probably won't even talk to you about it. We'll get technically qualified bidders, and then we'll consider those who are willing to do the job for the lowest salary. Now, there may be some jobs we would do that on, but our work experience say, tells us, well, we'll just miss too many things. It's impossible to, to specify that closely. And furthermore, there's no absolute one best individual because it depends who else we have in the team and what are the strengths and weaknesses that we've got. So I think... All this is something that's worth taking account of early on. So it will, it will change our selection processes. So we're looking at um, uh, competence-based selection. I think the, the reward mechanisms need to be fair and appropriate. Now, mm-hmm. I've used the techniques of early supplier involvement or early contractor involvement on narrower work packages within projects where the supply base has been willing to contribute during that early stage as part of their overhead. Because normally they know the tortuous process of bidding for that work package is not cheap. I don't know if the data is the same in the US, but there's some UK data that says the construction sector spend as much money running estimating teams as they make in profit for the whole sector. It's and they got to make, the, make those fancy presentations too. Yeah, you got, but, you got to but, have the beautiful, the beautiful slide deck with all the fancy charts. Those, those don't come for free. Oh yeah, and, and of course we're now in a vicious spiral where the fancy slide decks are written by fancy slide deck preparator, preparers. They're not yep. the people that you think you're assessing. What you're doing is you're assessing the the proposal writing subcontractor capability of the contractor that you think you're bidding so mm-hmm. yeah <clears throat> yeah quick quick and quick and dirty good enough selection and actually i think this helps suppliers as well as buyers the right commercial mechanisms which might be a straightforward reimbursable basis in this early stage unless it's reasonable because it's about the same order of magnitude that the businesses have already uh, sort of cemented in as as part of their fixed costs overhead basis and Are there any strategies my, that you would use when you're in that selection process? One of my favorite ones mm. <clears throat> when selecting contractors is assessing capability. And mm. I love doing hypothetical scenarios. So I get the proposed six people in. I tell them, here's your kind of rough schedule. The project's now delayed. How would you work through it? And I get yep. to sit there with the six people and work through a hypothetical scenario of, the place now, you know, procurement's late. What do you do? And see the team work together. Are there any other detailed tactics when you're in that to kind of tease out how the team's capability or you said a different word than capability. I'm using capability, but how do you yeah. figure that out? Uh, that's a great approach, Micah. Little little role plays based around situations yeah. that they, they're not prepared for. So you're really testing what they've internalized and how they think. Uh, and you can observe that. Another one that I've used is uh, during during the selection process, get them to prepare a risk register based on their understanding of the project. So the project would have a generic brief so they'd know that it's you know, a bridge over land rather than a bridge over water. They'd know roughly where it is. They'd know 
the economic environment they're working in. So you're not looking for an accurate risk register. You're looking for their thinking and their understanding of what might go wrong and what they could do about it. And that's uh, that, that's another little technique that can be used during selection. Again, just to trigger a discussion where you can you can listen to the genuine capability, competence, call it what you will, of the people being proposed. Now, That's there's, a good there's, one. Something else, there's something else to tie into that selection process. I think it's very important to keep it short, sharp and sweet for, for the interests of the owner and for the interests of the suppliers as well. Uh, now, one of the benefits is if the selection process is nice and short, because you're looking at competence and capability. I don't think you have to draw it out a particularly long uh, period of months and months and months. If you do that, it's not unreasonable to ask the contractor, show us the people you're going to put on this job. And since we're going to be deciding within a few weeks, it's not unreasonable to hold them available. If you've got, you know, give me a six month bid validity, which is very often the case, and I'm asking eight people to bid, I think it's unreasonable for a client to expect the contractor to hold those people on the shelf doing nothing, given there's a seven out of 8% chance those people, they'll get no return on that investment anyway. But for a few weeks, particularly if a, a bidder is in the short list of two stage, I don't think it's unreasonable to say, well, hold on to those people for a couple of weeks. So speed can really help with that as well as... Uh, avoid wasting time Let, let's pull on let's pull on that speed comment and actually flip the conversation the other way around because we've all, we've been talking about a contract a client going out to a contractor organization and obviously we've been talking about that because you've gone in and you're advising the ceo of a general contractor and your yep. initial advice was think more like a client let's be very very clear that the three of us know that there are um competitive differentiators or perceived competitive differentiators that processes like these make general contractors not want to share and engage. So I did a I did an analysis a little bit ago on the UK construction market and and basically it's almost as perfectly competitive as you can possibly get if you analyze market share and, and profit rates across the sector. Somehow people think they've got a competitive differentiation Apparently, that means it's either fragmented market or they're kidding themselves. What people think is is how they act. What might the um, might the challenges be from your friend, the CEO, saying, "Well, I don't want to do that because I'll give away this." What could be the things that she thinks she might be giving away? What she will probably need to give away are the importance of the skills that have got them to where they are. As, mm -hmm. as, as you say, they, they, it's a generality, but it's probably a reasonable approximation and truism that uh, you bid to win, but you make, uh, you make your money on the changes that come through from that. And I think earlier on, Greg, you said, you know, without getting into detail of where that's come from, my view is that comes from the project owners. They've got the supply mm -hmm. chain that the practices that they put in place or accidentally allow to put in place. It seems a perfectly logical conclusion to me. But I think the main contractors can change that, but it's quite difficult. So uh, We might come back to that uh, if we have time later on. Um, so back to the question about what they might be giving away. It would be all those hard-earned commercial skills in uh, you know, finding loopholes, blocking them if they're going to hurt you, and exploiting them if they're an opportunity to make money. Because they're the rules of the game that the client set up. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, if that's what the contract says, I have no problem people implementing what the contract terms say. Um, my, my uh, challenge to her would be if peace breaks out in the industry, if your biggest competitor starts offering a, you know, an offer that owners just can't turn down, you know, yes, I will sign up to those draconian conditions, but and, and actually as a main contractor, I will 
I will suggest that you increase the amount of damages for lateness uh, because I'm so confident in my ability mm -hmm. to hit them. I will, uh, yeah, I will want you to put uh, more significant damages in the contracts because that will reduce the number of uh, people I've got to bid against. Mm -hmm. Because if I apply these same principles downstream, now this is something unique about the main contractor. Most main contractors, certainly in the UK, be good to check uh, whether the experience in the states is the same, Micah. But most main contractors have, uh, you know, gross margins of twenty-ish percent, meaning eighty percent of the income that comes through to them they spend with other people. And once they've got a small number of employees, the vast majority are employees for the duration of the contract. You know, they're taken on and then they're let go. They'd be exactly the same people if you let the job with another main contractor. So there's a small number of key employer employees, which represents probably 15, 20 ish percent of the total contract value. So that's their competitive advantage, not really the 80 or 85 percent of the value that's being delivered by the supply chain. Now, if the main contractor was to manage their supply chain differently, then that significantly increases the leverage point. But I think that would need different skills and experience than their current approach to managing and getting more out of the supply chain. Because where I've looked, main contractors love to talk partnering and collaboration and alliancing with customers. Mm -hmm. But their relationships with their supply chain, they adopt a totally different philosophy. Uh, such as uh, such yeah. as we have 90 day payment terms because what we're going to do is take that money invest it earn a tiny bit of interest and then give it to you yeah at, at, so there's uh, the, there's managing on the cash lead yeah, generate a cash mm -hmm. lead as early as possible and do something in terms of treasury or financial management but there's also that sort of pressurized leveraging the so-called offloading of contractual risk to the supply base. So they contract based on fixed price lump sum. They use sort of the the negotiation techniques of the £800 gorilla. Uh, and, and they get what they can get away with unless they happen to be buying from another £800 gorilla and then they just have to put up with it. So, mm -hmm. so they, yeah, fixed price lump sum shopping, offloading of risk, uh, all the things that add to risk and cost to the client. And, and, and what that means when I was saying, you know, think as a, as, a, as a project owner, there were two parts of that. One is align and synchronize the work of the whole project team to the owner's project objectives. When you have mm -hmm. commercial contracts that get in the way, most of the highly paid people throughout the supply chain are focused on the commercial interests of my employer. And so they should be. Yeah, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but because of the contractual mechanisms, that makes it important because yeah, there can be significant win or losers involved. Once you remove that risk, there's another skill. And yeah, what do we do now? Now that peace mm -hmm. has broken out, what do we do instead? And they've probably not got the skills to coordinate and synchronize the work of major projects uh, in a way that actually makes them significantly more efficient and effective to deliver. I think we've got used to, we've got programmed that, well, projects take as long as they take because the world's somehow different today or whatever mm -hmm. other excuse. But I think there's an enormous gap. I think we could deliver projects significantly more efficiently and effectively. and. And our sort of so-called delivery models, which are not delivery models, the contracting and purchasing models, uh, yep. nothing to do with delivering the underlying work. They're about contracting. And in the public sector, it's almost as though they assume that all there is to delivering a big contract, sorry, a big project is to let some contracts. I'm not sure there's any evidence that that's the case. Hey, folks, we value your time. But we could not stop this conversation. So this is just part one. Stay tuned for part two, which will drop next week. If you've enjoyed it, please like and share with a friend. Catch you soon.